Hi, my name is Benedict. This is lesson two in effective music making. If you did not watch lesson one uh, and preferably the intro, please go back and do those. It is very easy to think that uh, I will, I'll just bypass the, uh, the basic stuff and just do the advanced stuff. Uh, unfortunately, that kind of tends to cut your own feet off your call. I also hope that you did your homework practice uh, because without actually getting the understanding and none of this is book understanding and that's where people go wrong it's about being able to understand can you tell me how to walk no ultimately the best advice you can be is like yeah just do it and don't fall over because you can't explain in any intricate detail how to actually walk you can point to pictures of um, cgi skeletons walking and saying that's how you do it but you don't really know how to do it because it's something that's inside you. Music is something that has to be inside you. Practice is what helps get you there. All right, this time we are looking at chords. Chords become incredibly complex when we get into musicology stuff. The reality is I do my level best to avoid musicology. Musicology is fascinating, but remember musicology is the study of what someone did. It's never the study of how to do it. Yes, it can be translated around to say, well, hmm, this piece worked so well, and this is why it worked so well. Therefore, we can learn the lessons of this piece. But that doesn't mean that you can simply go, I'll do that and duplicate that, because either you're just plagiarizing and you will get done for it, or you don't understand why that worked in the first place because normally there are other things going on. So chords. The very first thing that we will meet is that people will say, but I don't need chords. And I'm going to say yes and no. Let's look at it. Does a song need chords? Technically, no, it does not. In the early days, music was monophonic, meaning that there was one set of tone, as in there was no harmony. So essentially, the piece was this. And much folk music, ethnic music, to this day, is still essentially monophonic in construction. One of the most famous forms of monophonic is, of course, Gregorian chant. Gregorian chant, there are people singing, but they're all singing the same notes. So it's lockstep step movement. If we were to take these other voices here, we've made our piece multi-timbral, as in we've got several timbres working. So we've got our piano, our bass, our mid and our high instrument all in the game but they're all playing exactly the same notes. It is possible for that to be stretched out into different octaves. We'll leave him where he is and move him up. But this is still essentially monophonic in the sense that musically there is really only the same thing. All movement is in lockstep. It helps to understand this because then we start to look at why we use chords. The difficulty with that is as you quite quickly work out that it's a little bit thin or simplistic. That doesn't mean that there isn't huge value in it. Gregorian chant is very powerful. Worked for Enigma. It also worked for early doom bands, so doom metal, the, the, the form, uh, it's not uncommon for it to be either partially or fully monophonic. The other thing is that we have what's called implied chords. Because we work in a musical environment now where chords exist, chords become implied. So where we've got our lines like this, if we were to translate these just to the bass, Boom, boom, play them super low. Let's put this in solo. This implies 
a set of chords. They're not there, but nonetheless, we have a key and scale working here. Relatively easy to work out what that is, because we start on C, we've only used white keys, so chances are this is C major or some variant thereof. If we were to take the easy punt, we're going to say that's C major. So we've got a key and scale, which means that chords become implied. So that's something to bear in mind for later. Really, we're just looking to say that does a song need chords? Well, they're there already. We then look at polyphonic. Polyphony is having many notes happening at once. Remember, different sounds all happening at once is multi-timbral. Polyphony is where we're playing more than one note at a time. In synthesis, we get excited about that because it's a polyphonic synth. But lots of instruments in the real world weren't necessarily polyphonic or were played monophonically anyway. So the introduction of chords is these are the chords that are essentially implied when we dragged the root notes and put them into a bass line. We were still implying these chords. So that becomes the next stage. Notice how much richer that is than if we're only playing a single note or even having those three or four layers of instruments playing in different octaves but moving in lockstep. This has become richer. That's a big development in music. The next development that we have is, remember, lots of instruments are actually monophonic, is to take our notes, our chord, and split them out. That's a big move forward. When you listen to this, with each instrument being monophonic, but expressing the chord, and if we get into this here, we've got them expressing that chord across different octaves. But can you recognize the feel of that sound? It's kind of Baroque music. So this is the first stage out of medieval, or what we loosely can refer to as folk music. But notice how that's richer, it sounds nicer, because we've got each timbre playing where it works. Obviously, our bass sound is playing in the bass register. Our mid note in the chord is playing in the middle, and the high note in our chord is playing up top. We might call that lead. So this is both polyphonic, as in because we're playing many notes at once, and multi-timbral. And that is a big step in richness. The reason I bring it up is because a lot of beginners' music tends to be monophonic. They will go multi-timbral early these days, far earlier than we used to, although singer-songwriters tend to be playing chords, often too many chords, and forgetting the monophonic side, uh, but gobs of chords because they go, oh, I need to fill this space, man not realizing that what needs to fill the space is the flapping of the gums and the story that's being told, more importantly. So this allows a greater sense of richness. But it's not until we get to here that we really change things. Now, the next evolution from monophonic construction or monophonic construction that is multi-timbral is to finally hit harmony. Yes, chords have harmony, because when we play these chords, we, it's richer. It's nowhere near as rich as... Whether I'm playing the same chords or not, it doesn't really matter, but... is richer. So it's important to understand that difference. Now, if we take our chords and we mute them, and we apply just the instruments, but the instruments are moving around. A 
twice. Middle. Laid. And notice how that is so much more complex in what it delivers than monophonic construction, regardless of number of timbres. And one of the problems is if you pile up too many timbres when you've got monophonic construction, is that it just turns to globs of ugh. Now, again, this has nothing to do with genre. It's not about whether you like or don't like what I'm writing here. These are exercises to help understand. So now, if you go back and think about what I've just said, if we start with monophonic, it's incredibly simple. We can add a couple of layers of different sounds and it complexifies a bit. And Gregorian chant will have people singing in different octaves, but remember, everything moves in lockstep. So there's only so much complexity that we can have in the story that we tell. The reason that stories like The Lord of the Rings are so successful and so perennial and so drive so many other attempts to express that kind of story is because Lord of the Rings is incredibly textured. Middle Earth has so much texture in it, at times too much. Song of Tom Bombadil, perhaps. Did many people read that? But nonetheless, we know that it's there. And Tom Bombadil has this whole backstory that we like knowing is there. And when you watch poor quality movies, watch them on Tubi or something like that, the movies are incredibly... They're not much fun to watch. They're easier if you're doing something else, although actually they're harder because there are so many holes in them. They don't explain Tom Bombadil why there's any relevance to him. They've got no backstory. So the worlds are empty and therefore the films just fall flat on their asylum faces. Although the asylum ones are funny. So once we've got to this step of going, okay, I can have harmony, see how these notes are moving around each other rather than being locked to here. This one started on the same note. An octave apart makes no difference. And then moves to the third. One, three, and then five up here. This actually starts with by expressing the one, three, five. through an arpeggio and then goes back to the five and dances around and uses variants thereof. In this, it's mostly all chord notes, but we do have one that's outside of that. Actually, no, that's in the chord note. Sorry, my, my bad here because we've got D. So that's still a chord note. Every note here is what would be in the chord in this place. So here, that, then we move to A, meaning that we've got uh, A, C, and an E. So E, G, well that's getting a little complex, but that's the seventh chord now. So we're adding extra complexity while still using key, scale, and essentially chord notes. We haven't got any complex passing notes in here as such. And that allows us so much more freedom of movement. It is super important that you get this, because without this, you're really going to find that it's very hard to build the complexity, the pro feel that you're looking for. One of the frustrations that we have with um, modern film music is that largely we have dropped harmony. Most modern pop music has dropped harmony. And you might go, oh, well, then why would I need to learn it? Because it will come back. And if you don't know how to do it, you don't know how to break the rules. Remember, early doom metal tended to eschew harmony and write monophonically for that rigid lockstep medieval kind of feel. If you write film music and you just work monophonically and ba 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 it sounds impressive initially. I started listening to a record just the other day whilst I was killing monsters at the end of my day 
a Western movie. And you know what? It was irritating. And the only reason I didn't turn it off sooner was, A, I was killing monsters. Uh, so it would have taken me away from that to change it. But I really kind of wanted to. And B was I was trying to force myself to be cool and listen to it. But there was no point. After the first 15 or so seconds, I had heard everything he had to offer in that whole record. Because not only was it monophonic, but it was monorhythmic. Do you get what I mean? As in, it had the same rhythm every single track. There was nothing of any merit to keep interested. Okay, people were saying, yes, it's amazing, man, and that's fine. I guess there are some people out there who only want to listen to monophonic, monorhythm music. This is a nature of the world, but you can't learn to write better music if you think that's the only way. When the wind changes and people look for something deeper, something better, something with a stronger story, if you can only write monophonic, monorhythmic, no matter how many timbres you pile up, you're done. Just finished. You've got no hope. Uh, and traditional musicians, including the Sex Pistols, had better musical understanding. It might have taken them some time to get there, but they had better musical understanding than that. So look at how we've got variety of rhythm here. And so we've got something far more textured. This is why chords and understanding what they are and how they work, regardless of how you express them, because notice here I'm expressing those chords without actually playing block chords. Let's in A, B, so if we've got our block chords, not very exciting. Extrapolate it out into harmony. Now look what happens when we put the block chords back in. You get my point. By actually expressing the block chords as well as the monophonic multi timbre that move around those chords, we get a very rich sound with only four instruments. This is the key that you're looking for. It's really important that we have moving harmonies. The problem with that is it's still essentially monophonic construction. Where we've got that, we've got moving harmonies. Is that any good? Well, no, not really. But the point is that you go, hmm, every time... we get a slightly different harmony. And that is where we get much more interest and much more texture in our music that you can't get out of monophonic writing, regardless of whether you're using chords or not. So we're looking to get to the point where we can have moving harmonies and be in control of them. Alrighty, let's get into chord 101. This is a chord. One, three, five. That's the simplest chord. Before you go, but I don't want to do it that way. Yep, you can do it whatever way you like. That's a chord. That's a chord. That's a chord, as far as I'm concerned. The rule books will say you have to play three notes. There you go. Now you're happy. That's a three note chord. Is that a comfortable chord? No, because, but if that's what it takes to get your story told, then that is the right damn chord to use. Find a name for it after the fact. So none of this is about saying you can only do this and move in lockstep, because that's monophonic thinking and not understanding the power of harmony. This isn't really ultimately about chords, it's just about how to make your harmony work. And going, I don't need harmony, well, that leaves pretty thin pieces 
which will be forgotten very instantly. And the problem is that if your listener forgets you before you've even finished your first song, and I get the people will be saying, but Benedict, you're so boring that I've lost interest in you before I finish this. It's like, well, yep, I get your point. I do. I don't pull faces. I don't pop up silly graphics and what have you. This is not the Baby Yoda show. But what I'm going to say is perhaps you're not as interested in music as you thought you were. So, generally, we start with the triad. It's a one, a three, a five. And I hope you did watch the octave thing, because then this will make sense. If not, please go watch the octave thing. It's not right for me to waste time, because I'm trying to jam several hundred years of understanding into about an hour, and I've used 20 minutes of it already. One, three, five is our standard chord construction. We can voice this lots of different ways. One, three, five. Look where I'm putting that. One, three, five. I can put it down there. So your voices inside your chord don't need to stay exactly where they are. We can bust this right open and do that. Or we can bust it open and do that or this. And they are still this. Important to really get that. And that's part of your homework that I will say right now is play a chord and then look at ways to express that chord in different octaves. Guess what? That's a C major chord. Some musicologists will be able to tell you within a heartbeat what inversion of that is. I don't care. But understanding your first inversion, which is largely taking your top voice and putting it at the bottom. Drop it an octave. That at least reminds you that there are inversions and that you can then go taking that, putting anything anywhere. This frees you up because you can then say, okay, I've got those voices to deal with. Which one do I want to put in the bass? Okay, it's easiest to put that one in the bass. But you don't always want to put that one there. You might want to put your third or your fifth in the bass. It's up to you. And chords are not about saying you can only do that. It's about giving you this tremendous freedom to be able to say, okay, what's going to work and what's going to work easily? Inversions are the key, the solution. Now, we do need to get into naming because you will encounter naming. I do not want to see anybody going out there going, oh, well, I'll just Google best chord progressions. This is a chord progression. A chord progression is where one chord moves to another. Okay, those first two are exactly the same chord. They restated each other. Ooh, that's different. So we now have this C progressing to an A. The naming convention, I'm going to simplify to simply say that, well, that chord is rooted in C, this chord is rooted in A. Therefore, I'll call it the A chord. It does get a little bit more complex and initially confusing. We've said this is C major. We're playing only the white keys. And we know how to define C major because we go tone, tone, semitone. Tone, 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 semitone. What if I want to make a D chord? How would I know to define? Tone. That's not a white key. That doesn't belong in C major. So when I'm playing a D in the key of C major, I can't play that because it's got one of the black keys and I'm not allowed to have them. If I go C major, D major, I've just changed key. And while you can do that, the problem will come in that every time you play something new, you're changing key. 
the cat sat on the dinosaur who was playing with the nuclear bomb is an incoherent story. Purple dishwasher monkey, incoherent. So we need to stay within our key. So the solution there is that C major, root chord, we know where we are. We move to the D chord, we're now playing a minor because this is not comfortable in C major. So we move it so that it stays in C, and which is by making it a minor. So just to be aware that when you read something that says it's this chord into that chord, it will commonly say C major into D minor, into something major, into something minor. This is how the world works. It's just a naming convention, and it's a way of making sure that we stay in the key and scale that we've defined. And remember, you can define anything to be whatever you want it to be, including keys and scales, so long as they are consistent. But if we move across key every time we play a new chord or new section in our piece, because each chord here is a little mini section, then we simply confuse our listener. We don't want our listener confused. Our aim is to create a coherent story. Notice that in the middle of Lord of the Rings, there isn't somebody with a laser sword. There isn't a spaceship. There isn't a baby Yoda. There isn't a dinosaur. Well, I guess there is, his name's Smag. But he's not introduced as a dinosaur, he's just a dragon. He's coherent with that universe. So your key and scale, and how you express your chords within that key and scale are about creating coherence. That's all this is about, creating harmony, everything that is coherent to your story. This is the really killer thing to take away from the understanding of harmony as expressed through key scale and chords. How do I make this coherent? That's all it's about. Because if we start by doing this, we've created a problem. And Music theory is merely about saying, okay, I see you got a problem there, buddy. You just changed key and that's going to be incoherent. How do we solve that? We'll let you have the D chord by, ooh, <laughs> by flattening it. We'll simply take the, the voices that you're playing that are breaking your coherence and make them coherent. So for simplicity's sake, I would simply say C chord, D chord, E chord, F chord, G, A, B chord. Resolution. This is important. Really important to understand that. Spend your time in the homework that you do working out how that works. Yes, so your chord progression is merely working through a set of chords coming one after another. There are a pile of rules, but they are small r rules. They are rules like in C major, we would play D minor. They are merely helping you not make a rookie error. But it's best you ignore them. Simply stick with the big R rule, which is your story needs to be coherent. The universe that you build needs to be coherent. You can't have Lord of the Rings with laser swords and land speeders because they are not coherent in that universe. That's it. Largely, forget the rules, throw them out. Follow the need. This is the really important thing. Your universe needs to be coherent. Your universe will tell you what makes it coherent. And the better you get at storytelling, the more you know how to make things coherent. The next issue that we have with chords is that they are, when expressed in their what we call root form, you can see here, there's just a big lumpy jump from one to another. Let's expand these. We need to look at smoothing this transition. What if we take this guy and we move him back down an octave? Oh, hang on. 
That's a lot smoother, isn't it? Yeah, that's not so good. We can take this and move him an octave. I don't like it as much, but it's still okay. It's gonna largely depend on where we're going next. But for the moment, I'm gonna say, let's drop him an octave. So now the transition between these two chords is fairly minor. Rather than asking people to sort of envisage a whole new world, like getting halfway through book one of Lord of the Rings and then suddenly there are laser swords and land speeders and Darth Vader, which is what's happening with these big leaps in our chords here, we're now saying you really only need to grok to understand this transition here. And it makes more of the harmony. And we can choose how that's expressed. As you saw, if I kept this one high and made the other one, you know, the, the way that we've expressed that. So now there's a big leap here from here to here. Yeah, okay. It's all right, but it's not that great. So what if we take this? Now we've got two that are the same, two that are differing. Much more comfortable. This I can tell already, that's just a great big leap there. That's got to be problematic. Oh! Now this may be problematic. Let's move it. Now I'm going to say there's, there's a little from column A and there's a little from column B. We will get into this, what I'm about to do more later, but it's good to see it early as well. Let's just drag this out. So I'm going to say let's take this fella, put him back up. Actually no, let's take him, put him there. Let's take this guy, put him back up there. And let's see what we've got. See how this now is far more coherent than these, which just leap about. There is no right or wrong answer here as to what you should do. We might take this here. That works nicely. The problem we've got is the transition from there to there. Now, that's a thing that we can look at solving. Let's just take a little bit, move him, let's just reduce his length. Now, how can we express this? Oh, look, problem solved. So our block chords now are still the same chords. I haven't introduced any new notes or voices. I've merely smoothed them out. I'm not interested in technical rightness, technical wrongness, because that's irrelevant in an exercise piece that has no world or purpose to the story. What if we take this guy That works nicely too, but it's essentially where we were before. What if we take this guy and drop him? This may be a bit wild. Yeah, it's because we don't have anything there already, but if we had another instrument, particularly a bass that was playing underneath here, this extra note that appears here could be like, 
exciting. There's no right, there's no wrong. Work with what works for your peace, which is not what you want, but what the peace needs. Tolkien may well have wanted laser swords and land speeders in Middle Earth, but at a certain point he would have gone, this makes no sense here. While I could beat Jules Verne at his own game, it won't make sense for me to introduce laser swords uh, and, uh, and green puppets that eat frogs. Uh, so I'll just go with what I've got, but I'll make great use of what I've got. And great songwriting, great storytelling, because they're the same thing, is about making the most of what you've got. And most material that I see online that really isn't making it is because the person hasn't made the most of what they've got. Just listening to a singer who is, well, rather limited, but he's doing something very interesting lyrically. His music is not good because it's just the same thing over and over and it's irritating. He thinks it's interesting because in the first couple of seconds it's interesting, but then it's just interesting, interesting, interesting. There's no movement there at all. And um, as a result, the package comes across lacking confidence because he lacks confidence in his delivery, not just in his voice, because he's not exhibiting confidence there, but because the music isn't building a nice world. And by nice, I mean, it doesn't mean it has to be pretty. Cannibal corpse are good at what they do. They're very consistently cannibally and corpsey because they build that world that way. So these... Things are about saying, how am I going to help my story to express itself the best possible way? So you get your chord progression, which can start by going. But we probably then want to smooth it so it flows. How you choose to make it flow, how you lay those chords out by just moving things around that's entirely up to you. There are more things that we can do here, but we're going to cover them as we start to get into melody because they're the leap between chords and melodies. So chord progressions. Please don't go out there and go, oh, well, I'll just look for famous chord progressions and steal them because you're not going to understand why you're using them. If we've got this... We've got a sense of climbing here in the way that these are expressed. It's a slow climb. And this brings us down. But what if we wanted to express that to say, OK, let's have this go up. We could just keep going up if we wanted to. This won't necessarily be good. I would actually suggest we might do this. Let's copy this guy. I don't want that. Fingers are very cold, so I'm not doing a great job. Let's take this guy and shunt him up there. Every move here is an octave. Let's shunt that down. It's a little incoherent, but get the sense that this is continuing to climb. So this chord progression as such, we could say, if we're going to stick with something a, a little bit um, sword and sorcery, is that we've probably got a king coming to visit. So we're building a tension and a sense of majesty at the same time. This last chord is not comfortable, so let's deal with this here. Pop that up there. Yeah. 
there's no right or wrong here. People will tell you there's a right and a wrong based upon applying something a musicologist wrote or somebody who's trying to be a musicologist and say, you should do that. Yeah, there are ways that it will flow easier, but without a story, there is no right, there is no wrong. Lots of movie music actually breaks lots of rules. That's the one I always go to. Consecutive minor seconds. Mozart didn't do it that way. Why does this work so well? Because it's terrifying. Shower scene from Psycho induces the terror of having someone with such a bad haircut appear in your shower. And there's not really any better way to do it. It works so well. So forget the idea of silly rules. Now we'll look a little bit more chordiness. There are other things that we can do with chords. We'll just drag these guys out of the way for the moment. One, three, five. That's a basic expression of our chord, our major triad. But you don't have to stop there. If we add another one on top, remember each one has got that gap in the middle, you've now got a major seven. So that's what's called a C7, because it's got one, three, five, seven. Now that's interesting because that's added a real kind of tension to it. There's an excitement because it's higher, but there's a tension because look where this note is. Hands up anyone who can tell me what that's trying to do. Resolve. That's a C major chord with an octave on our, of our root up here, but that's down here. That's trying to go somewhere. That's got to do something. So seventh is probably the most common chord in jazz thinking because it's like, oh, it's, it's got to move. It's created some tension. We need to create tension and release. As we can see, as we're starting to do there with that chord progression, we were building tension as it climbed up and then we had to try to work out how to release it. I'm not strong enough with chords to say you just do that, but it's not my job to say you just do that because other people are going to go away and you just do that. No, you've got to work out how to solve it, but the more you understand the basics of the concept of harmony, which is how to make these things harmonize with each other to achieve the desired result, and that is actually excellent use of harmony, despite the fact that it breaks every simple rule. Dum 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 is excellent use of harmony. So, you can keep adding things as long as you've got keys to press. And that becomes a whatever it's called. So, 7th, 9th, 11th, 13th. I don't think I've ever seen anything past the 13th written, but these are legitimate chords. So that's now got us up on an A. We're playing a D and an F. So in the middle of that chord, we've got this, which is our cadence pairing. So you can use more complex piled up chords. People will talk about those sorts of things as being stacked chords, or I believe they're also called slash chords. Who cares, name whatever the hell you want. It's still a C chord with lots of stuff on top. C9, it's a C chord. It's still working on the basic thinking of a C chord. We then got things called the suspended chords. And you're like, ooh, suspenders, that's got to be exciting. And suspended chords are exciting. There's our straight chord. A sus4, suspended 4, is moving our third into the fourth. One, two, three, four, five. One, three, five, one, four, five. It's a sus four. So where you go, oh, but you can't do that. It's like, yeah, you can do that. Remember I said you can do that. That's a chord. There's been some kind of name for it, augmented sus, sus four or something. Actually, no, that would probably be that. That's a legitimate chord. That's a very nice sounding chord in the situation. Augmented.
C major org. Sus4, Sus2. That's a lot closer. One, two, five. We could augment that. These are all chords. They've all been named. There's bazillions of names out there. Don't go learning them because it's irrelevant. What you need to be doing is simply going, what does my piece want? If that's what my piece wants right now, that's pretty cool. That's my chord right here. That's what I'm going to play. It may be difficult to voice, especially with strings on here, this bit. So we either move it out or find another way, like voicing with one instrument doing this, another instrument doing this. It's merely a way of understanding the harmony of putting these voices together. Now remember, our octave, our scale, they have relationships. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight, seven to eight, which is unison. And that relationship is consistent. So if harmony is merely sort of going, oh, well, I'll use the relationship between one, three, and five all at once, not just in passing, but all at once. One, four, five, all at once. One, four, augmented fifth, all at once. Harmony is just all at once. Let's put them all together and see how, how nice it sounds, or how bloody awful it sounds, to become perfect for its purpose. Oh, I've got through this a lot faster than I anticipated because I am cutting out so much stuff. But it's not stuff that's really important. Remember, my approach here is not to teach you everything that's in the four-part harmony book by What's-His-Face, which I had when I was a kid, and let me tell you, I would rather kill myself. I tried reading it several times, and I would still rather kill myself. It's not because it's bad or wrong, but because it feels so external and top-down, and it doesn't feel like music. That feels like music. This for all its limits, and the fact that it's not quite working right, suggests music. What if I decided I wanted to turn this into a sus? I don't love it, but I can do it. Maybe one of these will work better in, a, uh, in a, a position like a suspended of some kind. I can't remember what this chord is or was now, where its root is, um, but nonetheless, we could move, we could simply say, okay, what if we do this? I quite like that. It's created a tension here, which wants to be resolved. That's a resolution. Is it a great resolution? Possibly not. It becomes incredibly grand. Let's see if we... Yeah, that works better. Now, I'm moving those notes pretty randomly now, and I'm allowed to, because all that I'm doing is using some kind of variant of a... Uh, or some kind of variant of an existing chord, which somebody has named. And they've only named it because it's useful to have names for things. Oh, dude, can you play a, um, can you play an E47th sus? Yep, dude. Oh, that works nicely. That's the only reason they've got names. See, that's, it's working. That's all it has to do. It's still not great. And a musicologist or somebody who's more experienced than me in this sort of stuff would come along or but, 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 and they might, if they were in a poor craftsman, go, you've got that wrong in a condescending kind of way. That's not how you do it. 
if they were good, they'd come along and go, this isn't quite achieving your aim. Here, let's move this here and here and here. And you'd, I'd listen to it and I'd go, oh, yay, now I'm super. But let's say this, which is admittedly not necessarily the most elegant, let's say this went out and I had a number one with, hit with, with this. And it became famous and people started to say, what did he do there? That's kooky, but that's amazing. That's so... And it becomes the new fashion. Then while there would still be some Eddie the Expert trying to say, well, this is all wrong, you're not allowed to do that. The true musicologist would say, that's very unusual construction because he used a this and a that and a the other. And this is why you like it, because that's the bit that's like, oh my God, nobody does that. And that becomes a new rule. People would be copying me. And suddenly, this would be the thing that everyone was trying to work out how to do. They'd be coming to me, Benny, can you make a tutorial on how to do that thing? How to break the rules. The rules are you do whatever you need to get the story done, and you use whatever you can, and you stop when you can't go any further. Sure, if you've got access to one of the Bee Gees and say, hey, dude, what do you reckon I could do here to achieve my stated aim? Not to achieve my aim of sounding like a Bee Gees song, because that's probably not what we're doing here when we're having the king's entry. Then that's cool. That's still you using the tools at your disposal. But otherwise, you put it out, you move on. Somewhere down the track, you might work out how to do that a little bit better. But so long as this works, great. Righto. Homework. There has to be homework. You have to practice this. And I've already covered some of that. Which is, firstly, define chords. Understand the difference between the major and minor expressions. So C, C minor. D major, D minor. So if I'm going to stay in C, C, D minor. C major, D minor. Just understand that it works. I'm not expecting you to have to go through the whole keyboard and learn every variant thereof. Merely just to understand that a major at your root is most common and that somewhere off your root, a minor is probably going to be the more common thing. Otherwise, you've simply broken the key, which you're allowed to do, but if you keep breaking the key every time a note is pressed, people are like, where on earth are we? And they're confused. And if that's the aim to confuse your audience, by all means, but make sure that you're giving them confidence and reassurance in what their real world is with regards to your particular song and story. So then also lay out some chord progressions as we did here. Initially, lay them out just as root form. One, three, five, one, three, five. Lay them out pretty randomly. You can start by going, oh, well, I'll work on an implied chord. Okay, cool. I think that's going to sound kind of cool. So I will lay them out. Like that. Then I will work out how to smooth them off. What do I move? How do I move one of those notes up or down an octave until I get a smoother flow? See how this here is a smoother flow. Don't go in terms of saying this is right and this is wrong. Merely see how you can get the flow to be smoother and to seem to go somewhere. It's not always advised to just be traveling up. This is generally an unwise construction. So you generally want to move in an arc. And how you move in an arc is what your story's like. Do you go up and then fall back slowly? Do you go up or fall back? Which is why I'm trying to fall back towards the end here. That's all I want you to do to understand that. So get your notes laid out how you want them to be. If you're going to work in C major, please start on C and aim that wherever you end up. Here I'm ending up here. We've got to work out how to transition back to the start again. If it won't transition nicely, your job is to work out how to do that. So homework. Play through all the things that we've done, which is to understand the difference between monophonic, polyphonic, multi-timbral, which is where you've got many voices, 
those multi-timbral can still be monophonic construction and the monophonic construction can still exist if you're just moving everything like this. You don't get true harmony or true polyphonic until you're moving harmonies, as in you're changing the distance. Here is what's called a pedal point or a grand bass. And I showed you that last time, because that's still cool harmony. Because we're changing the relationship between those two notes all the time. So your job in homework is to play with chords as I have here to start to really feel how the notes within that chord work together. If you have a door, which I would hope you do, then once you've played with that a little bit, look at taking the notes in your chord and spreading them out, which is quite simply doing this sort of thing. So if I take my chords, I can take only the low note, drag him down, and not that far because that's going to be too low. I can take my chord again, drag him out, chop off the low note because we only want the middle one. Go again, chop off the lower notes because we only want the high one. Now we've got this expressed multitambrally, and therefore we're starting to make something of our polyphony. It is kind of easier often to mute this, but I would recommend keeping it there. Just do that bit. We're going to look at making melody um, in a later video, possibly the next one. I haven't really settled on that. But spend your time working around how do I come to terms with how these voices work together. Move to a sus4, gets tight, sus2, little interesting. But these are all your variants. Just get used to the basic idea of those and your first inversion. So run through your chords. So if we go, lop the top one off, drag it down an octave and play it. That just to remind us that we can take any of these notes and put them somewhere else. And it's still the same chord allows us to choose how we voice our chord. And then you will find that you've got something like this. And that's starting to suggest to us how we might have a melody. And once you get to that point, you're going to be like, which is why I think melody probably will be next. Now we've, well, effectively hit our hour. If you have questions, if you're wanting to hire me, then contact me directly and we move to student rates. Uh, if you are not wanting to pay, then we move to public. So you pop your question below so that everyone can share. Because if you're asking the question, chances are a fair percentage of the audience are asking that question as well, simply because that's going to be a really common question. So do the right thing, put the engagement here. Oh, something I was supposed to do at the beginning, but totally forgot because I forgot to write it in here. And it's not a habit, and I don't like being a beggar, but it has to be the way that this works, is that if you are getting value from this, I didn't say if you enjoy this, this isn't meant to be fun. If you are getting value from this, please go across to my coffee uh, and donate because it's the only way that we can justify spending the hours or days that it takes to do this. I've spent most of a day already setting up just this, making sure that we've got a coherent boiling down of a couple of hundred years, or actually no, it's, it's the best part of a thousand years of harmony. 
uh, understanding into an hour. That takes some time and energy. And there's plenty of much bigger minds before me that I've been able to leapfrog on, but they get their return somehow, and it's the only way I'm going to get my return. Okay, please, do your homework. If there's questions, ask them below. Uh, and, yeah, come see me next week. Thank <laughs> you.